Good morning, church. It's a joy to be with you and to share in this time. We are so blessed by your participation with us via uh, live stream, Facebook Live, and those who may see it even later on YouTube uh, or on our webpage. We are so glad to have you with us at whatever time you join us. And we want you to know that uh, Wellspring continues to be that place where all are welcome, all are accepted, and all means all. This is a safe place. This virtual space is a safe space. And we look forward to this opportunity as to, to share in worship today. We uh, do want to invite you to, uh, to be sure on Facebook that you, uh, in, the, in the description there, you see the word see more. You want to click that because that's what gives you all of the various links. And so that gives you an opportunity to register your attendance, to make your gift online. It gives you an opportunity to, uh, to find uh, the link for kids online for those who have, uh, for those who have, have their uh, children with them. Uh, that's an opportunity for you to download some, some uh, uh, activities for the kids to do during this time of worship. And we also uh, invite you to look at our small group ministry opportunities and the various other links that you'll find there. Today, following the service, well, first of all, it, this is United Methodist Women's Sunday. And United Methodist Women uh, are such, a, such an important part of Wellspring and of who we are as a church, uh, as a denomination. One of the things that we've known is that during times like this, during times of of, of separation during times of, of hardship that so often it has been uh, not the men who have, have forged ahead, it's been the women who have forged ahead so often. And we are so blessed by uh, the opportunity to have, uh, you'll see women in leadership and the Reverend Martha Basak is uh, one of our, our clergy. She's, she belongs to us and uh, she's going to be preaching. And so we are so glad to uh, to welcome Martha today. Martha, we're glad that you're going to be with us. We um, do want uh, to to remind you that there's a how about it today. So Martha and I will be coming back after the postlude. And so here are the questions for today. You'll see those in the stream. We'll, we'll pin them to the uh, description later. Uh, but how do you experience God's forgiveness in your Christian walk? That's one. Two. How do you model Jesus' command to forgive in your relationship with others? So this is uh, an important, important opportunity for us to talk about grace, to talk about mercy, to talk about how we build relationship. And so be thinking ahead about what you're going to be doing. So um, after you see all of the, the things that we're doing, uh, we want to share with you now a word from Kenneth Smith, who is our United Methodist Women's uh, president. And so, here's Kenneth. Good morning. For those I have not yet had the opportunity to meet, my name is Kenneth Smith. I'm the president of the United Methodist Women here at Wellspring. Hard to believe it has been 12 months since our last UMW Sunday, where Wellspring dedicated a Sunday in September for the women of the church. It's crazy how things have changed. I love how God's path continues to lead us and giving us the ability for me and these amazing ladies who are here today in red, the ability to interact with you in this unconventional way. Reminding you that the United Methodist Women is an organization for the women of the church and also for the women of our community. When I read through the word of God, it's evident how Jesus feels about women. He created us lovely and strong to be respected and cherished. When a, woman, um, when a husband and a wife marry, he tells the man to love his woman just the same as Christ loves us, to treat her with the utmost respect and honor. Jesus ultimately set the standard for how women should be treated, not only by their husbands, but also by the other women who touch their lives. This reminder of the Bible represents how I feel about the women of this church. Each one of you continue to demonstrate the power of Jesus' love every time I have the honor to interact with you. We had our first Zoom meeting on August 1st. It was such a blessing to see all of the beautiful faces who could attend. This was the start of uncovering the possibilities of bringing the women of the church together. 
Each year, there's always been a women's luncheon put on by Dolly Schubert. She does a fantastic job. This year, we will be having a Zoom picnic luncheon scheduled for October 17th. As you can imagine, the fun will be held in a very different way. So please stay tuned, more details to come. We are also looking for leadership volunteers. If you are at home and need something to do, there's no doubt we will find the perfect spot for you. We are looking for a vice president, a secretary, spiritual growth and communication leader. Please reach out to me if you are interested. Like Jeff said, the United Methodist women have always pushed us forward in the United Methodist Church and the women of faith in our faith, in the Christian faith, have been the one, as George says, that are always carrying out and pushing forward the gospel. So we sing this morning, we worship, let's join together in song. I hope you'll sing at home, I hope you'll move, and I hope you'll remember that God is the one who always calls us forward, always calls us to let go and to let God be God. Deception caught up in my own hesitation until you love to cover me. So I let go and I let love show me life like it's supposed to be. And oasis, here awaits us all the freedom I live. Unlike before, the Father's heart is beckoning, and I can't resist no more. Lead me in the ways of devotion. I don't want to get caught in the motions. My heart is only for you, Lord. Ooh. So I let go, and I let love show me life.
Chorus again, so I let go. Oh, so I let go, oh, and I let go. Oh, Show me life like it's supposed to be. And oasis, oh, here la, oasis. Oh, la, All the freedom I ever need. Now I'm alive. Oh, la, la. Oh, la, la. When I let go, then I find life. Oh, la, la. Amen. Hey friends, it's Mr. Rodney here to bring you today's Kids Minute. Now today we're going to do a mathematical equation to help us find out how much that God loves you and I. Now I have to ask this question, what plus what equals 100%? Now you can say 50% plus 50%, or you can even say 75% plus 25%. They all help equal 100%. Well, what does it mean for you and I to go and give more than 100%? You see, that's something that gets asked of us probably a lot more frequently than what we like to think about. You see, there's someone that's always going to ask us that, no matter what the situation might be. It might be a game, it might be when we're in the classroom, it might be while we're performing, that someone will ask that of us to go and give more than 100%. And I love thinking about this because I love thinking about it from the place of what the love of God looks like for you and I. So, with that being said, we're gonna figure that out, how much that that really is. So, if you can, come in a little bit closer because we're about to see what that means. So, if you were to take the letters A through Z, now mind you, this is a crazy formula that's been concocted. I think it will work and help us figure this out. But, if you take the letters A through Z, and you line it up with the numbers one through 26. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. So we're gonna take the numbers one through 26 to help us figure this out. So we're gonna take the word hard work. We'll write it out. And then from there, what we're going to do is add up these numbers. So with that being said, we find the numbers eight, one, 18, four, 23, 15, 18, 11. We add those up and we get 98%. Well, now we're going to take the word attitude. Well, that would add up to be, let's see, 1 plus 20 plus 20 plus 9 plus 20 plus 21 plus 4 plus 5. Huh, that equals 100%. But let's look at how far the love of God will take you. So we're gonna use that phrase, love of God. And we have 12 plus 15 plus 22 plus five plus 15 plus six plus seven plus 15 plus four. And we get a grand total of 101%. So therefore, with mathematical certainty, we can say that while hard work will get us close and attitude will get us there, it's the love of God that puts us over the top. You see, in Romans 5, 8, Paul discusses how God loves us just the way we are. That he sent Jesus to die even while we were still sinners. And even in, in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, there's this word everlasting that pops up. And that it's, it, it's this everlasting love that God has for us. This love that will never end. And to prove that point, Paul comes back and says... In Romans chapter 8 verses 38 through 30, 39 that nothing can separate us from the love of God you see sadness can take away happiness someone can go and steal money from us but nothing still can separate us from the love of God 
And that's powerful. That's something for us to remember that no matter what's going on throughout the course of our day, whether we are at a high or whether we are at a love, that nothing is going to take away the love of God. That God is going to love us no matter where we are at. And if you don't believe it, look at the math and go do the math again. The love of God goes over the top. It's 101%. And that 101% of God's love is for you and I. It's something amazing for us to think about. It's something amazing for us to fall back on. So this week, if you're struggling, remember that God loves you. This week, if it's an amazing week, if, you, if, it's, if things have been going great for you, remember that God loves you. Now, don't forget to go to our kids online page so that way you can go and do our lesson that we have lined up set up for you all there we'll see you guys next week have a great one bye Good morning, church. We're reading this morning from the book of Psalm, chapter 103. This is a comp composition of thanksgiving for God's goodness. Remember, the first verse of this chapter reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless his holy name. Beginning with verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Greetings to all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is fitting to give God thanks and praise this UNMW Sunday and every day for all his many blessings. In keeping with the team for UNW Sunday, God of many chances, let us bow our heads in prayer to meet God and rise to give of ourselves that God's abundant and beloved community for all can be realized. Let us pray. Everlasting and forgiving God, the God of many chances, we thank you for your mercies which are new every day. 
God, we thank you for your faithfulness, and most importantly, we thank you for the gift of your beloved son, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for giving us peace and hope amidst these uncertain and turbulent times. Help us to stay focused on you amidst the various distractions in the form of COVID-19, storms, hurricanes, flooding, shootings, unrest, prejudices, discrimination, and all that keep us from your love and serving you. Lord, you know our hearts, and you know our needs, and you know the hearts of those around us and their needs. So we lift those and ourselves in need before you, asking and believing your promise to heal and supply all of our needs as you comfort us. We pray for members of our church who are sick. We pray for guidance for the leaders of our local community, our state, our country, and the world. We pray for those who are hungry, homeless, and destitute. Help us to be more compassionate, caring, and forgiving of each other as you have forgiven us not once, not twice, but 70 times seven times. Lastly, we pray for your blessing of our Pastor Jeff and all leaders and ministries of Wellspring and UMW as we bring forth your word this morning. We pray for all these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Our reading from the gospel comes from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. And this is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus said, not just seven times, but rather as many as 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, they brought to him a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Because the servant didn't have enough to pay it back, the master ordered that he should be sold along with his wife and children and everything he had, and that the proceeds should be used as payment. But the servant fell down, kneeled before him, and said, Please be patient with me, and I'll pay you back. The master had compassion on that servant, released him, and forgave the loan. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 coins. He grabbed him around the throat and said, pay me back what you owe me. Then his fellow servant fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused, instead threw him into prison until he paid back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what happened, they were deeply offended. They came and told their master all that had happened. His master called the first servant and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you appealed to me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was furious and handed him over to the guard responsible for punishing prisoners until he had paid the whole debt. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if you don't forgive your brother or sister from your heart. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'd like to thank Kenna, the women, United Methodist Women, and Jeff and the church for giving me this opportunity to share today. I always enjoy it. Uh, the preparation and the delivery uh, reminds me I can still do it, but also that I'm glad that I'm retired and don't have to do it each week. But uh, thank you. A and now uh, let us pray together. Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. I don't care if you're young or old or somewhere in between. I think we all find that there are times when we find that we have a need and a desire of, thank, of forgiveness. You know... It may be a small thing, it may be a big thing, but somehow we failed. We've come up short. And so with hesitation, we go to the person that we've offended or wherever, and we say, you know, give me one more chance. And if we're really serious about it, we may even say, please. Yes, Looking for forgiveness is one thing, but how about our willingness to give or grant forgiveness? Unfortunately, sometimes when we do it, it's conditional. You know, we're thinking, how many times has that person wronged us? What's the magnitude of the hurt that we've experienced? And so we may be limited or sparing in our giving forgiveness. But that's not God's way. God is always reaching out to us in love. And God truly is a God of many chances. This passage in Matthew and the passage right before it address a community of faith. It's not just a crowd of strangers gathered together, but those people that belong to the group. As some tr translations would put it, to the church, though we know at the time of writing this, that was before the church, but it's a concept we can relate to. Those that claim a common faith and are in relationship one with another. It's ideally, as we state in our purpose, a place where all are welcome and all are accepted. But in reality, sometimes it's a place where relationships can become stressed, strained, and even irritating. It's a place where acceptance should reign, but frequently Forgiveness is necessary. And in this passage, Peter is looking for approval. He, uh, I think in some ways, when he brings this question to Jesus, there's just a little bit of smugness in it. He really thinks he's saying something. When he says, you know, should I give forgive seven times? After all, rabbinic tradition said to forgive three times, and he's offering seven. But Jesus responds with the idea that forgiveness doesn't keep score. Now, you can find translations that say that you should forgive 77 times, or seven times 70, 490. That's not the point. The point is, forgiveness is unlimited. And then we go on to this parable, which it's meant to shock and startle. It's full of exaggerations. It's not do this, do this, do this, but it's trying to get our attention. And so there's the first servant. His debt is insurmountable. One talent was equal to 15 
years' labor. And he owed 10,000 talents. Nobody's lifetime could ever expect to repay that huge amount. But yet he said, have patience on me. And the master did. He had pity and compassion, and his slate was wiped clean. You know, imagine how he felt, the relief, the joy. But even in the, as he is rejoicing in his good fortune, he's unable to extend forgiveness to someone who is his equal. That person that owed him uh, the denarii and his amount of the debt was equal to a hundred days wages. That's a doable amount. And he's asking for the same patience to repay what could be repaid. But that servant is having none of it. He wants it now. And the passage concludes admonishing to forgive a brother or sister from the heart, from the caring, from the emotions, not from the pocketbook and from the head. So I think of Peter at that point. Peter, one of the disciples, very outspoken, but many times a little unsure of just where his place was, and he had to contend with his brother Andrew, who just seemed to be of such a patient temperament. And so I'm sure there was some sibling rivalry there that made it hard for Peter to comprehend forgiveness. And then Matthew, who wrote this gospel, he's the disciple that was a tax collector. He knew about money and debts. Each had his own reason to ponder the meaning of the parable. Just what did forgiveness entail for them, for us, or for anyone? When we come to a moment of forgiveness, we think of it as a moment's transaction. But it truly is an ongoing practice, an attitude of the heart, a way of approaching life in relationship. It's necessary, but it's not easy. It means letting go allowing ourselves to be released from the effects of the hurt we've experienced. I like that. Released from the effects of the hurt we've experienced. It doesn't mean denying the hurt, and it doesn't mean pretending that the hurtful behavior doesn't matter but we are to forgive freely from the heart, not begrudgingly from the head. And because it doesn't come naturally, we need an example and a guide. And Jesus Christ provides for us in his life, death, and resurrection the example we need of God's unconditional love for us. Peter, like us, was thinking of measurable, countable mercy. And he was slowly learning about God's unlimited grace. When we have forgiven someone or been forgiven, the next step needs to be reconciliation. Restoration of fellowship. And God 
gives us the most wonderful example in saying that God is willing to let bygones be bygones and encourages us to do the same. If we have accepted God's unlimited grace and allowed it to affect our lives, are we willing to live differently in relation to others? Our way of life as Christians is to reflect God's spirit so that others will see and come to know God. We can't do this by our own strength or desire. Our limited resources can lead to stumbling and regression. That's where I think the words of Psalm 103 that we read come in like a like a salve, like a bomb, showing us God's unlimited mercy and grace. The idea that God's high in the heavens is still concerned about us like a parent to a child. God is the source of our being able to accept God's forgiveness and the willingness to extend forgiveness to others. See, we don't take the first step. God takes that first step, shows us how to go. Jesus says, come follow me. And God knows our limitations and our hesitancies and still says, I love you. I forgive you. Will you accept that forgiveness? And then willing to take that next step to extend forgiveness to others. The next illustration in the psalm just gives us a sense of how great that forgiveness is. God doesn't just remove our transgressions. God makes a radical separation from our being, from our person, and our transgressions. He says he removes them as far from the east to the west. I like to travel. I like to go to other countries. This year has kind of messed that up big time, but... uh, As I look at a globe, the words in this psalm have come alive for me. If you take a globe and you start going north on the globe, eventually you'll start going south. But if you start on that globe and go east, or you could go west, but keep going whatever direction you start, so we'll say east, you will never stop going east no matter how long you keep traveling. God's forgiveness separates our transgressions as far from us as the east is from the west. Yes, God is a God of many chances. And God keeps giving us opportunities to accept God's forgiveness and then encourages us to extend forgiveness to others. So this this morning, I challenge you that we would commit to living life in a manner so that the whole of our lives become a song of praise and thanksgiving to God. Knowing we are forgiven and living in a way that says to others, I am willing to forgive you too. Thanks be to God. Amen.
blessings that this pandemic has brought to us is the ability to gather in wellspringers from no matter where they are and to bring in Anne Marie who uh, is in Dallas and uh, to sing with Andy and to to be be in this place uh, to make this moment a holy moment and it all starts with this thing that we call generosity it starts with this ex- ex- extravagant giving that is wellspring and we have been so blessed by the many ways that you've given and George has shared that with you every week all the things that we do we continue to do during this time the ways in which our small groups connect the ways in which we still carry out ministry in our community in our region and abroad we um, we can't do it without you and the way you've been supporting and caring for us the plate resembles something that we put in, that we, we give of ourselves. 
and I know a lot of people have, uh, have kind of missed that, that traditional opportunity to put something into the plate. But just know that we feel your hearts poured out, whether you give online, whether you mail a check, um, and you can, you can do both. You can mail a check to, uh, to our P.O. box that is, uh, we've been advertising uh, in our e-news, but it's uh, Post Office Box uh, 1969, and it's Georgetown, Texas, 78627. And um, so you can give in whichever way you would like to give. We feel your hearts being poured out as you pour out in worship, and we experience your love as you have poured yourself out into ministry. So let us pray. Oh God, in the many ways that we give, the many ways that we experience you giving to us, even in the pandemic, even in times of isolation, even in times of political and religious strife, that we experience your goodness poured out so much into us. So here we offer this time to pour ourselves back out to you in the various ways we give as we speak your word boldly into a world that so desperately needs to hear the word of grace. Through Christ our Lord, given for us. Amen. So how about it, church? This is our opportunity to respond. And um, you have the, the how about it questions that are on Facebook that are there for you to be looking at how you experience forgiveness and grace. But the question for us as a church, regardless of whether you stay for the, the uh, how about it conversation at the end, this is a question that I think we all have to answer. How is it that we carry out acts of compassion and mercy and grace in a world that so desperately right now needs to hear that word of grace? And where is it that you can share the, the, the word of grace that's hard or maybe difficult for you? This is our opportunity to respond as we join, join in this last song together.
So we're not going out from this physical place. But we will, in this week, have opportunities to interact with others. And as you go, may you feel yourself wrapped in the love and care of God's forgiveness and be prodded and encouraged to extend forgiveness to all you encounter as you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are so grateful for those of you who are staying, who uh, in, are, are part of this, uh, the, this, this conversation that we love to have at the, at the close of many of our services. Uh, we are using the how about it uh, uh, hashtag, so it's uh, an opportunity for us to engage with you. And we have a few who have, have uh, responded in this, and so we want to take an opportunity to share, to uh, to be in this this moment. So the first is uh, from Nancy. Extend forgiveness so hard, that, but so necessary. And um, yeah, that's something that that when we talk about forgiveness, Martha, we're going to have that conversation now. So, so what is it that this? I, I think sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in extending that forgiveness to look at what we're doing for the other person and lose sight of the fact of what it does for us. The yeah. release, the turning loose of hurts and bitterness. And so, yes, it's hard, but so necessary, not just for the other, but for me. It is a gift. It, it's, and that's one of the things that I think, you know, as we talk about grace and forgiveness and we talk about what it means to uh, forgive uh, for, forgive our ourselves to forgive others uh, and um, I think the camera was moved just a little bit but uh, we we want to I think Martha that's exactly what you're talking about that yeah. that the the toxicity that can build when yeah. we fail to forgive and we carry all the bitterness and we carry all the hurt with us and certainly there are people who experience trauma in their lives and it's really hard to forgive the person that perpetrated something against you. And I get that. But it's really so powerful when, when you see people who, who learn how to practice forgiveness and what that does. So, yeah. So what's, what's, another, what's another one? 
Andy, when I feel incapable of forgiving myself, it's God's forgiveness that carries me through the day. Yes, that is so true. So, yeah. I, I think uh, sometimes it's so easy to focus on others and so easy to hide what's in us. And the act of forgiving ourselves can be so difficult. Mm-hmm. But it's that realization of God made you, God loves you. Embrace God's love. Turn loose of your own hurts. Exactly. And, you know, it's a, um, there, there's something that forgiveness does in building community. And that's where God, I think, is, God's the one who is the creator of community and calls us into community together. And one of the stories of forgiveness that is uh, still always just kind of rises to the surface for me was after uh, the tragic, uh, uh, it was a murder that was involved, that was a, in, the, um, in an Amish uh, uh, community. And after a certain period of time, the community came together. And it wasn't just the family that offered forgiveness and grace. It was the community. And it was something that by the outpouring of that, it didn't, didn't mean that they weren't holding the person accountable. It didn't right. mean that the person got to be free and, and do all that. But it's still just this incredible gift of how working from forgiveness builds not just, not just uh, the, the relationship with another person. It, it, it enhances our relationship with God and it builds community. So uh, I think that's really, really important. I, I would build on that. Sometimes the knots in ourselves we don't know are there. <laughs> when I go and get a massage, I'm always surprised as they start pushing places and, oh, that's what was hurting. And it's as it's released, then I have the ability to go on. And so sometimes those knots of unforgiveness that are in us, we don't know we're there. Right. But right. Michelle, I get to see forgiveness every day with my middle school kids at work, school. Uh, middle school is hard for them, but without forgiveness from others, it would be a <laughs> lot worse. It's good to know our parents are teaching their kids to have a forgiving heart. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's big. Um, and you know, as, as in in education, uh, we 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 watch uh, kids. We're watching our grandkids now being starting in school, and and um, and not knowing what to do with the the hurts that invariably come your way. Yeah. And so Michelle's right uh, of of how you connect with those kids. So anything else, Martha? I, I think too. Just bringing up. Uh, the teachers and the parents in these times just for all of us to affirm and encourage and support because they're daily having to practice forgiveness. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. And from Albert, when I'm in need of God's forgiveness, I feel disconnected from him. When I ask to receive his forgiveness, the connection is complete again. Yeah, there, there's that, that, that one part that, uh, you know, it's like people don't necessarily have to ask to be forgiven. If, if somebody's wronged me, I may practice forgiveness even without a request. But what does it do then for the requester, for the person who has, who has grieved, and you come asking for forgiveness? That's, a, that's, that's the other, other side of it, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I think the person that receives that uh, has a new awareness of acceptance. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to be perfect to be accepted. Yeah, and and it moves uh, it moves to that place uh, where last week, as I was talking about false self, true self, and kind of distinguishing between those. Uh, the false self is going to be the one that says, "I don't think I need to be forgiven. I may have hurt somebody, but it's, I don't care." You know. The true self is going to be the one that's going to practice the humility of the child, which is at the very beginning of this, of, of this chapter that we've been in, that, that when the disciples say, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God, then Jesus says, here, where's a, where's a child? Bring a child. And they put the child in the middle, and he says, those who are humble like this child. 
they're the ones who experience the kingdom of yeah. God. And it does, it, it moves me to a place where when I can own up to my shortcomings, I can own up to all that. I can say, Martha, I just got to be honest, I, 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 I messed up. And it moves me to a place where I get to empty a little bit of this ego and a little bit of this stuff out. So, And you're, or somebody else doing that, kind of works it opening up the person that hears that to be willing to do it too. Right, right. It's all about relationship. It's yes. about how the relationship is built. And, uh, well, friends, we this is our, uh, oh, we have one more. From Louise, uh, <laughs> Louise, our theologian, forgiveness is not transactional but transformational. Restorative justice is not to punish but to heal from Richard Rohr's meditations this week, and that's exactly right. It was from this week. So May we on. all experience healing in our everyday relationships. Right, right. And, you know, the... the uh, uh, the, the, one of the greatest books on uh, forgiveness is written by Bishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter yeah. who write this, the book on forgiveness. And one of the things that we often don't catch, we, I, think for, I think history, that when we, I don't want to ever forget this piece of history of when apartheid fell apart in South Africa. And, uh, and on occasion, we have, we have a friend who is related to somebody in this room who is in South Africa who comments and who uh, brings a, 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 is able to watch this at a different time. But one of the things that, uh, that, that happened was that they created uh, the, um, uh, the commission, uh, and it was on, what was the commission called? Does anybody recall? Forgiveness and Reconciliation. That's right. They go hand and in hand. And they go hand in hand. And so it was, it's that commission that, that they knew they had a job. It's, it's, we're going to hold, we're going to hold people accountable, but we also are going to invite people into a new relationship. So even the oppressor is invited into a new relationship. So in this, I think, Louise, I'm going to take this, that next step for us, that in this time of racial tension, in this time where we're experiencing such a great divide in our country, the, the, so much of the, the, the Black Lives Matter and the, other, the various other movements that, uh, that are speaking, uh, word, speaking truth to power in this, one of the things that we have to understand is it's not trying to just flip it and say now the, the, the oppressor is under the foot of the oppressed, but to say... Nobody needs to be under anybody's foot. What we need is a new world. We need, we need a transformed world. We need a relationship. And it's something that is saying that when we practice this kind of forgiveness, we can transform even systems that are racist and unjust. And in the process, bring even the oppressors into a new relationship where they experience race, where they experience life, where they experience hope themselves. So it's something that is, is restorative, that the restorative justice piece of this is so incredibly important. We're working toward healing. We're working for grace. We're working for something that's much bigger. So thank you. Thank you, Martha, for being Crazy. with us. And we are, we are so blessed and friends, uh, thank you for staying with us at home. And with this, we are we're we're dismissed, and Amen. you go in peace. Amen.